deep forest, you're more likely to find red maple than sugar maple. More suburban areas have the sugar maple around here. This is the sugar maple, Acer saccharum. And this is a very important tree in New England because the sap is often taken, not in this area, but other areas, and that's where maple syrup comes from, the sugar maple. It's a very sugary sap, and it's used for sugar maple. And it's got these big, broad, wider leaves than the, in the red maple. But this is just another type of maple, and these are the two most common types of maple in this area. And there's other maples. This is a small version that's waiting to become dominant. It'll eventually be a very big tree. It's called Quercus rubra, the red oak. There's also the white oak, which doesn't have these pointed leaves. It's got more curved leaves. The white oak is Quercus alba. And these oaks are very important because they produce nuts, like the chestnut tree. They're all in a group called catkin trees. And they produce the nuts that feed squirrels and other animals, insects. So they're very important food producers in this ecosystem. And so this one will grow big, big oak tree. And so that's what this is, right here. So this tree here is one of these trees, the huge trees you see behind me. This is a smaller version. This is called the white pine, or Pinus strobus. And it's got these thin little needles that they use, and they keep them all year round. They're evergreen trees. And that way they can get sun all year round. And they can, it doesn't take much energy to keep up these leaves, and they, they're pretty ready to grow. And so this one's pretty common around this area, especially. This is a very coniferous area of this forest. the ant from the family Formicidae. Its major source of food, as you can see in this picture, is definitely tree sap. And one of its, uh, one of its social aspects is that it makes nests and it builds nests in trees, as well as other areas, uh, from soil and plant matter. The Eastern Tent Caterpillar. An adult lays its eggs in a single batch from 200 to 300 eggs. Within three weeks, it the caterpillars become fully formed and develop in their eggs. They then chew their way out in the spring. It's now the spring, so they have chewed their way out, and then they all create a silk tent where they aggregate for their, the rest of their larval life. Here you see the red squirrel, Sciurus vulgaris. It's a tree dweller, and it's native to the coniferous forest. It eats seeds, conifer cones, fungi, birds' eggs, berries, and young shoots. In the distance, you can see the beaver dams. Beaver dams are important in protection against predators for beavers, but they are also destructive to forests. Each log you see was once a living tree, a tree that will no longer feed this ecosystem. Here you can see the white-tailed deer. It's medium-sized, and we were pretty lucky to see such a big one at that. It eats leaves, twigs, shoots, acorns, berries, seeds, grasses, and herbs. And it also stays closer to streams, typically. Woodpeckers are able to find tunnels in trees by tapping and they chisel out the wood and then open up the tunnel and then they can locate their food. Uh, the cavities may look like they're destructive but they're actually used by birds and tree squirrels uh, as homes. Here you see Canadian geese which typically feed on plant material, especially aquatic plants. Adults line up their goslings in a parade as they march, and parents are known to chase away nearby creatures to protect their young as well as themselves. So this is a gray cat bird, and it's a secondary consumer most of the time. And it usually eats um, usually arthropods like ants, beetles, caterpillars, grasshoppers, spiders, millipedes, and it also eats fruit sometimes. And its habitat is usually dense shrubbery. This is the tree swallow. It usually eats berries and flying insects, and its best habitat is usually open areas like the field that it's in right now. So, what are you doing around here with these birdhouses? Um, these birdhouses are for uh, tree swallows and other birds that like to nest in um, like holes or you just prefer a 
bird box. Um, what I'm doing here is walking around to each uh, bird box and uh, opening them up and counting the eggs of the trees log and um, trying to keep a record of that. I do it about three times a week. Um, what I'll do with that data is I'm going to compare it with um, the numbers from previous years. Um, there's, it's kind of scattered, but there's been a certain, couple, every few years there's been a count. And I might uh, take that data and also compare it to um, the dates of when they were laid to when um, to the temperature in, around this time of year. So why do we have the bird boxes? Like, what are you trying to protect the sparrow? Like, the um, swallows, why do they need it more than any other bird? Well, they prefer um, kind of a, uh, a habitat where they can make a nest in maybe like a tree hole. And uh, this kind of mimics the uh, tree hole. So it will attract them more. So why specifically swallows? Um, basically, uh, uh, Mass Audubon tries to attract specific birds that usually have um, a hard time with the different habitats and things like that. So why are you interested in this type of thing? Um, my major is um, I'm a secondary ed biology, so um, I'm teaching high school biology, and um, using this as uh, a way to get into the bio biology field and get a feel for uh, field work. a spider. This is also usually a secondary consumer and it eats all types of insects, usually anything that it catches in its web. And this is a pretty small one, but they usually like crevices and whatever else they can build a web. So they'll just pretty much be anywhere they can build a web and catch insects. What are some of the terrestrial or fishing insects that we have around here? We have green frogs. <laughs> we have green frogs. We have um, bullfrogs. You can see them sort of along the edge. They're not really terrestrial, but you can see them in the shallower water. Um, we also have quite a few species of snakes. We have northern water snakes. We have milk snakes. And hopefully, if you walk really quietly, watch out, they hear through vibration. So if you stay still for a minute, let me just look here real quick. See if it's out. Got a bunch of school programs coming by, so it might have been scared off. There's a, an eastern milk snake that. Oh, oh, oh. Right there. And if you want, I'll catch them. If you want a better look, do you see them right there? Okay, you might want to shut off the video for a second because it'll take me a second to catch them. While you're holding that, why don't you tell us what snakes like this or do for the young? Um, this is an eastern milk snake. He's getting ready to shed, which is, if we didn't have snakes, we wouldn't have any ice cream or pizza because they are the number one rodent control. What Joy is saying about the snake is that it, it's big, important for rodent control and the rodents eat a lot of the grass that cattle eat, so it's important for dairy products. And so that's why they're a tertiary consumer. They're a very important predator of rodents, and that's mainly what they eat. And the one specifically that she's holding is the eastern milk snake. And another important rodent predator is the red-tailed hawk.